looking at the on-demand economy. Do join me then. The Bottom Line was produced by Lucinda Burrell. This is Radio 4, now the shipping forecast issued by the Met Office on behalf of the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency at 1725 on Saturday the 23rd of October. There are warnings of gales in Viking, North at Sierra, Forties, Cromarty, Forth, Tyne, Dogger, Sol, Lundy, Fastnet, Irish Sea, Malin, Hebrides, Fair Isle and Faroes. The general synopsis at midday, Atlantic Low 981 expected just west of Bailey unchanged by midday on Sunday. New Low expected 200 miles northeast of Iceland, 981 by same time. My castaway is the philosopher and teacher Michael Sandel, who relishes the sparks of difference and discord in political debate. Not just for the frisson of having clashing views. The disagreement is a starting point to see whether the participants can respond to the competing principles that are at stake in the debate. That's the excitement of it. Michael Sandel, my castaway. Do join us to hear his Desert Island Discs tomorrow morning at 11. And now I do apologise on to the area forecast for the next 24 hours. Viking, North of Sierra. Southerly 6 to Gale 8. Rain, moderate or good. South of Sierra, southerly 5 to 7, occasionally 4 at first. Showers, rain later, moderate or good. 40s, Cromarty, 4th, Tyne, Dogger. South or southwest, six or seven, increasing gale eight for a time. Occasional rain, moderate or good. Fisher, German Bight, Humber. Southwest, three to five, increasing five to seven. Showers, good. Thames, Dover, White, Portland. South or southwest, four to six. Showers, moderate or good. Plymouth, south or southwest, five to seven, decreasing four or five later. Rain later, moderate or good. Biscay, southeasterly, veering southwesterly later, three to five, occasionally six at first in north. Mainly fair, good. Southeast Fitzroy, variable two to four, becoming westerly or southwesterly, four to six. Showers, good. Northwest Fitzroy, Seoul. Southerly five to seven, occasionally gale eight at first in Seoul, veering west or southwesterly, four to six. Showers, moderate or good. Lundy, Fastnet, Irish Sea. South or southwest, six to gale eight, decreasing four to six later. Rain then showers, moderate or good. Shannon, Rockall, south or southwest, five to seven. Squally showers, moderate or good. Malin, Hebrides, south or southwest, seven to severe gale nine, decreasing five to seven. Rain then showers, moderate or good, occasionally poor at first. Bailey, south or southwest, four to six, occasionally seven later. Squally showers, moderate or good. Fair Isle, Faroes, south or southwest, seven to severe gale nine, decreasing four to six later. Rain then showers, moderate or good. Southeast Iceland, southwesterly, backing southeasterly, becoming cyclonic later, four to six. Showers, moderate or good. That's the shipping forecast. Now on to the weather with Nick Miller. Hi, Nick. Hello, we've got a wet night to come in Northern Ireland and much of Western Scotland, in fact central southwest Scotland, here 20 to 40 millimetres of rain, maybe up to 90 in the wettest hills as a Met Office yellow warning for the rain, there's a chance of some travel disruption. We'll also see by the end of the night some rain heading in towards Wales and the western side of England as it clears Northern Ireland. East of all of that, it's dry, it's cloudy, it's a breezy and mild night across the UK. Let's take a look at tomorrow's weather now, starting in southwest England, Wales, the Midlands, and across northern England. Now, we'll start quite wet across western counties of England and for the west of Wales, and this weather system will then weaken as it spreads further east. So there'll be some increasingly showery rain moving eastwards and following on behind. It'll brighten up with a few showers. For southeast England and eastern England, much of the day is going to be dry. There'll be a few sunny spells. It's late afternoon into the evening. There's a chance of seeing a little showery rain here and there. 
For Northern Ireland, sunny spells and the chance of a shower once any early rain clears away. And for Scotland, the rain clears from the southeast by lunchtime. Behind it, it's a much brighter day in Scotland. There will be a few heavy showers, though, particularly across western parts of the country, that could come with a rumble of thunder. And it's another mild day tomorrow across the UK, highs in the range of 13 to 16 degrees. That's it. Back to Andrew Peach. Thanks very much, Nick. <laughs> Farming was everything that I was looking for. Come by! BBC Radio 4 follows some fledgling British farmers from springtime to harvest. July, August, we're looking into shearing them. The wool price was so bad, a lot of farmers were just burning it. A new generation experiencing an ancient way of life. What I don't think a lot of people realise is how much the farming plays a role in how the Lake District looks. Get out of breath, walking after you. The Young Farmers on BBC Radio 4. Available now on BBC Sounds. And this is BBC Radio 4. BBC News at six o'clock. This is Zepp Sounds. Good evening. Leaders of English city regions have welcomed an announcement of billions of pounds to improve their transport networks, but say more funding will be needed. Two of the biggest teaching unions have called for tougher COVID measures in schools in England to combat a rise in infections. President Erdogan of Turkey has taken the first steps to expel 10 diplomats, including the German and US ambassadors, in a row over their support for a jailed government critic. In sport, England's cricketers have made a winning start to their T20 World Cup campaign. Leaders of city regions in England have welcomed a commitment by the Chancellor Rishi Sunak to invest almost £7 billion in public transport outside London in his budget next week. The money will be spent upgrading trams, installing new bus and cycle lanes and refurbishing railway stations. The Labour Mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, said the funding was a breakthrough, but had to be backed up by further government investment, so buses in particular were cheaper and more frequent. Our business correspondent Katie Austin reports from Manchester. Next week, the Chancellor is expected to confirm £5.7 billion for a range of projects in England's big city regions, one and a half billion more than had been anticipated. It's aimed at helping to plug the gap between transport provision in London and other areas, including the West Midlands, which has been allocated just over a billion pounds. The Conservative Mayor there, Andy Street, plans to build a green transport network that connects communities. Darius Azadeh, a projectionist at the Mockingbird Cinema in Birmingham, thinks anything that might reduce congestion and make public transport more convenient will be good for businesses. There's a lot of drive being pushed by like the council for people to visit Birmingham more and they're putting a lot of funding into businesses like ours. So it's almost like to make it count, it really should be accessible to everyone and it's kind of strange how it, it isn't at the moment. Greater Manchester will also receive just over a billion pounds for schemes such as tram upgrades and dedicated bus lanes. The region's Labour Mayor, Andy Burnham, says it's an important first step. This feels like a breakthrough today. It's not everything we need, though. So this is the money for the infrastructure. We are also being invited to bid for money for services, so more frequent bus services and, crucially, low fares. And that bid is still in with the government. Around a billion pounds will go towards introducing simpler fares and faster journeys on local buses, using London's services as the model. That's part of an existing £3 billion promise. It's not yet known which places will receive the money. Labour has accused the government of lacking a coherent plan and says other projects like delivering HS2 to Leeds are also critical. The government says modernising the transport network is central to its levelling up agenda. The Treasury has also given details of half a billion pounds of spending on support for children and their parents, including a network of so-called family hubs across England. But a charity representing nursery providers and workers says the scope of the investment is too narrow. Our political correspondent, Helen Catt, reports. 
The largest share of the money, £200 million, will be used to increase funding for the government's Supporting Families programme, which is targeted at the most vulnerable. There'll be new investment too in mental health support for new and expectant parents and specialist breastfeeding help, while £82 million will go into setting up family hubs, described as one-stop shops for advice and guidance in 75 areas of England. Rishi Sunak said he believed the government had a duty to give young families and their children the best possible start in life. But Labour has pointed to the similarities between family hubs and sure start centres which were set up under Tony Blair. Hundreds of those have been closed since the Conservatives went into government in 2010. Neil Leach from the Early Years Alliance says there are significant gaps in the government's plans. It's welcome news for struggling families. What I find quite you know, frustrating is it beggars belief there's not a single reference in this proposal about providing critical support to nurseries, childminders, preschools, when government knows that they've been closing their doors in the thousands and yet they are left out of this whole policy. So I hope there's more coming in the spending review. The Children's Commissioner, Dame Rachel D'Souza, said she welcomed the £500 million support package. She herself has backed creating more family hubs. Government sources say the centres are an upgrade on Shorestart as they focus support on young parents as well as children. Together with the transport and other announcements, the Treasury has already started to rack up a sizeable spending bill. As the Chancellor has promised to fix the public finances without increasing borrowing, it remains to be seen exactly where he plans to get the money from to fund it. Two leading teaching unions have called on the government to bring in extra measures to help protect school children in England from COVID-19. The Association of School and College Leaders says some of its members are on their knees coping with rising infection levels. It's pleading for more vaccines to be made available for 12 to 15 year olds. The National Education Union says there are simple measures that could help. Kevin Courtney is its General Secretary. Following the Scottish Government on what happens if your brother or sister tests positive that you should stay at home until you've had three days and then a negative PCR test, that would really help. Looking at mask wearing, especially in the areas where cases are highest, that would really help. Boris Johnson is resisting calls from some scientists and NHS leaders for tighter restrictions. Downing Street says the situation is constantly under review, but the focus is currently on getting more people vaccinated. However, Professor Peter Openshaw, who's a prominent advisor to the government on COVID-19, has urged the public to do everything possible to reduce infections. I'm very fearful that we're going to have another lockdown Christmas if we don't act soon. We know that with, with public health measures, the time to act is immediately. There's no point in delaying. If you do delay, then you, you need to take even more stringent action later. Latest figures show 44,985 new coronavirus cases have been recorded in the UK in the last 24 hours. That's down on yesterday's figure of more than 49,000. Another 135 people have died within 28 days of a positive test. Doctors at NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde are urging people not to go to accident and emergency unless their condition is life-threatening. Officials say in a week nearly a third of those who turned up at casualty at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital had only minor injuries or issues such as sprained ankles, back pain, cut fingers or bruising. The Turkish president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has said he's withdrawing the diplomatic status of 10 foreign ambassadors who had called for the release from jail of a government critic, Osman Kavala. Mr Erdogan said the 10 ambassadors, including those from NATO allies, would be declared persona non grata, normally the first step in expelling a diplomat. Our Europe correspondent, Mike Sanders, reports. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan appears to be on the verge of kicking out ambassadors from some of his closest allies. All but three of the nations that have irked him are fellow NATO members. They include the United States, Germany and France. Despite the apparent urgency of his order, Turkish diplomats say they don't know when the process of declaring the ambassador's persona non grata will start. None of the embassies contacted by the BBC in Turkey have been notified. The ambassadors marked the fourth anniversary of Osman Kavala's detention this week by calling for a just and speedy resolution of his case. They asked Turkey to heed a European Court of Human Rights ruling in December 2019 that Mr Kavala should be freed. The judges in Strasbourg said there was no evidence that he'd funded anti-government protests six years earlier. 
A Turkish court originally acquitted him of that charge, but the acquittal was overturned on appeal. The charge has now been joined with others that he backed the failed coup in 2016, all of which he denies. The film director, who was shot and injured in an accident involving the actor Alec Baldwin, has issued a statement after being released from hospital. Joel Souza said he was gutted by the death of the cinematographer Helena Hutchins, who was killed when a prop gun was fired. Documents show a crew member handed the gun to the actor, unaware it was loaded with live rounds on the set of the film Rust in New Mexico. Sophie Long has been following the story from Los Angeles. Cemetery Fire and EMS, possible station emergency. Uh, Bonanza Creek Ranch has had two people accidentally shot. This was the moment the script supervisor made the call to the emergency services. She described what had happened moments before. I was sitting, we were rehearsing, and it went off, and I ran out. We all ran out. They were butt doubled over the ID and the, the camera woman. And the, direct, and the director. We now know that when Alec Baldwin was handed the weapon, he was told it was safe, what's called a cold gun. Yet the shot or shots it released killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins and seriously injured director Joel Souza. The person responsible for the safety of all weapons used on the rough set was Hannah Reed, a 24-year-old former model and daughter of a legendary Hollywood armorer. She spoke about her lack of experience just a month ago. By all means, I'm still learning. But yeah, Dad has taught me everything. I think loading blanks was like the scariest thing to me because I was like, oh, I don't know anything about it. As the investigation proceeds, more questions are being raised about safety standards and working conditions on set. A candle vigil will be held this evening in Albuquerque as tributes are paid to the life of Helena Hutchins and the incredible talent so tragically lost. The environmental campaigner Greta Thunberg has called for honesty from world leaders as they prepare for the COP26 summit on climate change, which starts in Glasgow in eight days' time. In a BBC interview, Ms Thunberg said that too often politicians weren't being straight with the public. They seem to spend their time trying to come up with loopholes to find excuses not to do anything, excuses to be able to continue like before and say that they are taking action when they are in fact not. So I want them to be honest with that because as long as the level of awareness is so low that it is today, they are going to get away with it and they do not want to be the ones who bring the bad news. Italy's former Interior Minister Matteo Salvini has gone on trial in Sicily over his refusal to allow a migrant boat to dock in Lampedusa two years ago. The leader of the populist party, the League, is charged with kidnapping and dereliction of duty, which he denies. Now sport, England's cricketers have made a perfect start to their T20 World Cup campaign with a dominating win over the defending champions. And in the Premier League, Chelsea have put seven goals past Norwich. With a full round-up, here's James Gregg. Thank you very much. We'll start with cricket, where in their opening match of the T20 World Cup in the UAE, England has started with a bang, absolutely destroying the West Indies by six wickets in just 8.2 overs. Adil Rashid took four wickets for England. Obviously, there's a bit of nerves flying around here, but, you know, we did good preparation, we prepared well, we all are confident in our abilities, and, and like I said, today was a, was a perfect start, and that's all we can have. That's all hopefully we can carry that on. The West Indies were bowled out for 55 in that match. Elsewhere, in football, a big Women's World Cup qualifier taking place between England and Northern Ireland. We can get an update from Hamish Marshall, who's at Wembley Stadium. At half-time, it's 0-0. England have dominated this first ever women's competitive international at Wembley. They've hit the bar through Lauren Hemp and Alex Greenwood. Amongst other countless efforts, Fran Kirby, Leah Williamson and Nikita Paris have gone close. Both sides have won both World Cup qualifying matches so far. And Northern Ireland has shown great resolve against the overwhelming pre-match favourites. Hamish, thank you very much. Now approaching half-time in the Premier League, it's 42 minutes now. And it's third versus fourth, as currently Brighton are losing 3-0 at home to Manchester City at Amex Stadium. The early kickoff in the Premier League today more than lived up to its billing of top versus bottom, as Chelsea thrashed Norwich seven goals to nil. England's Mason Mount scored a hat-trick in that one. There's only been one other win in the Premier League so far today, and that was Watford, who beat Everton five goals to two. Hearts are top of the Scottish Premiership. They drew one all with Dundee to overtake Rangers on goal difference. They play tomorrow. Elsewhere. 
elsewhere. There were wins for Aberdeen, Celtic, Dundee United and Livingston. There was a clean sweep for England's rugby league sides in their one-off internationals against France. The men's team had to work harder than the 30 points to 10 scoreline suggested, but a flurry of late tries sealed the victory. The women won 40 points to four. And in rugby union, Premiership leaders Leicester maintain their flying start to the season as they beat Sale Sharks to make it six wins out of six. James Craig. A hardware shop worker in County Down is hanging up his apron for the final time this evening, 66 years after he first put it on. Oliver Tomalty has spent his entire professional life at the store and is only retiring at the age of 83 because it's closing down. Tom Harrigan has the story. In 1955, Oliver Tumulty was a fresh-faced 17-year-old looking for work. An opportunity came up at Kelly's Hardware Shop in Downpatrick, and a career was born once his boss was satisfied he could add up. He took me into that wee office and he gave me a few sums to count up. Well, he says, I'll give you £2.10 shillings. That was a good pay at the time. For that money, he would fill packets of garden seeds and sell spades to farmers. And while the job changed over the years, his loyalty didn't. He loved it, becoming a trusted face behind the counter at Kelly's for more than six decades. But tonight, the shop has closed for the last time, meaning Mr Tumulty's mammoth shift is now finally over. After 66 years, I feel very, very sad. I have six grandchildren and I have one great grandchild, so they keep me busy. He's also planning to step up his bowls practice in the summer months, but has promised a handful of customers he'll still fix their lawn mowers at home too. The headlines again. Leaders of English city regions have welcomed an announcement of billions of pounds to improve their transport networks, but say more funding will be needed. Two of the biggest teaching unions have called for tougher COVID measures in schools in England to combat a rise in infections. President Erdogan of Turkey has taken the first steps to expel 10 diplomats, including the German and US ambassadors, in a row over their support for a jailed philanthropist. BBC News. And the news is read by Zeb Soames. Now, let's look ahead to tomorrow morning on Radio 4. Here's Justin Rolat. We've got a fascinating lineup for Broadcasting House this Sunday. We will be taking you on a whistle-stop tour of the four-and-a-half billion-year history of the atmosphere. And we'll be going on a journey a hundred million years into the future to discover what, if anything, will be left of the mighty works of the human species. Tony Blair will be on with advice for Boris Johnson on how to get an ambitious settlement from the Glasgow Climate Conference and two cities vie for the UK's cultural crown. On the News Review, Lord Geoffrey Archer, journalists Tim Walker and Ash Sarkar. That is all here on Radio 4 at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. Now, though, it's time for Loose Ends with Clive Anderson. Yes, thank you, Lou, and welcome to Loose Ends. And we're celebrating some British icons this week as we prepare to welcome world leaders to Glasgow for the COP26 climate conference. A chance to show the importance of getting gas-guzzling vehicles off the road, so what better time to have a strike on the Scottish railways? Meanwhile, the joint bid to stage the Football World Cup in Britain and Ireland has got off to a flying start, with the FA being penalised for the shambolic scenes in the summer at the final of the Euros. I don't mean the usual problems with an England penalty shootout, but the utter failure of stewarding and crowd control on the night in and around Wembley Stadium. Well done, fans and officials. That's the way to win hearts and minds. And above all, we continue to demonstrate our famous British stiff upper lip as we cope with COVID infections currently running at ten times the rate of every other country in Western Europe. Whether a stiff upper lip is as effective as wearing a mask, only time will tell. Well, no, come to think of it, time has probably told us the answer to that question already. But we're going to make sure plan A works or die in the attempt. Anyway, Al Murray is with us today. His famous comedy character, the very patriotic pub landlord, might have something to say about this. And Al will certainly have something to say about his new series on the Sky History Channel called Why Do the Brits Win Every War? And we'll be asking another question. Is Al Murray the new Simon Sharma or the new Mary Beard? Uh, Carla <laughs> Valentine. Carla Valentine has plenty to say about another British icon, Agatha Christie, whose books have been bestsellers all around the world for decades. Carla Valentine uses her own 
own experience as a mortician to examine the facts behind the fiction, and we'll be dissecting her book, Murder Isn't Easy, the forensics of Agatha Christie, while it's still hot off the presses. There's murder, crime and punishment from Pearl Mackey as well. She's about to play the detective uh, Jen Rafferty in ITV's new crime drama series, The Long Call. And Emma Freud, uh, well, she's got a long call. Uh, Emma Freud joins us from L.A., uh, but you're interviewing somebody here in the studio. Not sure how that works. Just remind me why you're in Los Angeles rather than London. You know, I'm still not quite sure why I'm here. I know why the rest of my family are here. Richard, my um, my boyfriend, is making um, his thing film for Netflix and uh, Red Nose Day America yeah. is happening quite soon, so he's working on that. All right, and you're freeloading, is that... Uh... <laughs> Well, my daughter's doing, making a TV show and two of my kids are at school out here. So what I realised I really needed to do was to learn a bit. So I've gone back to college. Oh, right. I'm now a student here at UCLA. But anyway, uh, <laughs> tell, tell me who you're going to uh, be interviewing for us today. Well, my guest today is, and I'm predicting this, um, based entirely on something I like to call wishful thinking. But he's going to be the next British actor to make it massive in America. He's Daniel Mays, with the cheeky baby face of an Essex lad and a CV involving some of the best TV and film of the last 20 years. A brilliant actor who has so often been the bridesmaid and is now moving closer to the bridal position and currently starring in the Sky drama series Temple. He'll be my gorgeous guest in about 20 minutes. Oh, wow, yes. I'm not sure what the bridal position is, but uh, <laughs> Daniel's ready to get his baby face somewhere near it. Uh, we've also got music on this show from Self Esteem and Griff Rees. Uh, but let's start with the Oxford-educated historian and broadcaster Al Murray, who some people believe to be a fictional character created for comedy purposes <laughs> by the real person known only as the pub landlord. But Al is here in real life to tell us about his new TV series, which has the provocative title, Why Do the Brits Win Every war so you've had to select the wars well actually you haven't selected them terribly because you've got some wars in there that britain quite obviously didn't win what we thought we'd do is treat that sort of patriotic attitude a bit like having a football team you know yeah. if, you, if you support brentford you think they're the greatest team in the world yeah. even when they haven't won anything so there probably is a sort of general idea that that we're good at this stuff wars a, a yeah. war and military stuff the, the pub landlord would tell you there's a thousand year clean sheet we haven't lost a war for yeah. a thousand years the hundred years war lasted a hundred years because we're enjoying winning it so much we well, I'm not sure Britain or England did win well, well, the 100 years war. Well, I think it was a defeat, what you're doing, wasn't it? What you're doing there, Clive, is letting the facts get in the way <laughs> of, 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 of an entertaining uh, hyperbolic premise. And, <laughs> and a thousand years is an interesting one, because well, just before that, the Norman Conquest was not an English victory. Well, yeah, yeah well, except what the pub landlord would tell you is that the Normans then turn into the English, so therefore that's a win for the English. <laughs> yeah. So I am, very, I am very, very interested in the, in the history of, of, of conflict. Yeah. Because it lays bare what, what a society's like and how it operates and what its priorities are. Yeah. And so that's the sort of thing we try to do. But it's me and five, six other comedians, yeah. funny people. So we're, we're having fun with the subject as well. So you start with the French and you, yeah. and you use the Napoleonic War. Yeah. Which is, a, is a definitely a chalked up victory. Yeah, and, and, and a good victory to have won. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a little bit like the Second World War. You can be feel pleased about having a Yes, it's the near, they're near enough the villains, the Napoleonic French, I think. The centrality of conflict in, in, in British culture it comes from the Second World War. Mm. Because after all, if the First World War had been the last major war we fought, we'd all think was a ghastly thing. Yeah, and misery. A misery and futility. Yeah. Because the Second World War... D d with, it's bad. It's, they're wearing black hats, to, to, to the Nazis. Yeah. But they're actual villains, and we win, yes. uh, one way or another. You can see why it occupies a place on the sort of right in our national imagination and culture. If the Second World War hadn't happened, we wouldn't be having this conversation now. But fortunately, for my broadcasting career, <laughs> it did. You're talking about this in a very serious-minded way, <laughs> a knowledgeable way. Yeah. And people think, oh, God, have a look at that. You don't get, a v I mean, there's little bits of seriousness, but yeah. most of it is goofing around yes. quite a lot in half well, costumes. Blowing uh, things up yeah. and everything. I mean, Pedalos recreating the Battle well, of Trafalgar. Yes. But other bits when you're running around in costumes uh, running across a field, it's, yeah. it's, it's, you're having fun. Yes, well, I mean, we are goofing about, but you know, it's the drawbridge to the fact in it. Yes. So, yeah. And you're quite rumbustious. You got off to, uh, well, you repeat it the whole time. You keep mixing up Britain and England uh, yeah. quite. Even though you've got a guy standing in full Highland dress in I your know, eye line. I know, but I think, but I, I mean, I actually think that that's 
actually representative of how the subject gets talked about. And that's one of the one of the interesting things yeah. about it is that you know that that. Napoleon would have would have thought, talked about fighting les Anglais. The oh, French yeah. would have, and 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 even the even the Second World War, they're, they're you know we're fleeing and in England is what the, the Luftwaffe are saying. They're flying against England. Yes. They're, they're not they're not talking about the UK or Britain. It's in, it's England. Right. And and I know that there's I know that this is contentious, but that's sort of that's sort of why it's in there because yes. this is. Well, you apologise on where. What do you make of this, Carlo? You are you you're interested in in. In death, so well, warfare I, I, must, must play I am. a part. I, um, the main thing that I was thinking, of course, was Agatha Christie, actually, yeah. the whole time that you were talking about that, because famously, you know, she had a very privileged, lovely, idyllic upbringing yeah. in Torquay, and then, of course, First World War, Second World War, and she had to muck in like everybody else, you know, yeah. threw amputated legs into the yes, furnace. She, 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 was a, she was a nurse in the First World War, wasn't she? She was. She, yeah, 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 yeah. Nurse in the VAD, and then yeah. after a, a short while, she became a uh, dispenser in the yeah. pharmacy, yeah. and then she did that again during the Second World War, so yeah. she was a really famous in the Second World War, but she obviously went went back and mucked in. That so all I could think of then was amputated limbs being thrown into a yes. furnace by Agatha Christie. Brilliant answer, Carla, which, <laughs> which gets us off uh, Al's <laughs> project and onto your book, which is uh, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, I, know, but just, I should just mention you're also on back touring again as yes. the pub landlord. Is yes. why you've got your hair shaved. That's why the hair had to yes. go. Yes. Are you enjoying, or I don't know if you've started the tour yet, but... Uh, oh no, we've started. Yeah. So, so you're going back in front of the... Because you're very much an audience interactive performer. Well, but basically, last March I said to myself, "Great, I've not got to go up and down the motorway. I'm, I'm, I can stay with my family. I'm a mature person who doesn't need the laughter of strangers <laughs> for personal affirmation, right?" <laughs> sure. And then, yeah, exactly. You see where this is going. <laughs> and then, in, and then in June, some uh, July, someone offered me a gig in a pub garden, a friend of mine, and I went and did it. Did half an hour, and I was oh. sky high for the weekend. <laughs> it's like having another cigarette when you've given up oh, smoking for ten years. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, good to see you. Uh, in, obviously, in preparation for the pub landlord, but uh, for the moment, you can see you uh, with with some hair, some sometimes yeah. on the program. Uh, why do the Brits win every war? It's on Sky History at 9 p.m. on Wednesdays. Episode 1 is available on catch-up. Tickets for Gig for Victory, which is Al Murray, the pub landlord's new 2022 tour. They're available now, and you can check yeah. Al's uh, website for details. Thank you very much for coming in. Uh, absolute pleasure. Excellent. Uh, music now from Self Esteem, the performing name of Rebecca Lucy Taylor, joining us today with an array of musicians and singers to perform a song or two from her new album, Prioritize Pleasure, which is out now. Hi, Rebecca. It's going really well. You've got a five-star review in The Guardian this week. I know. You won the Attitude Awards, or the, the Virgin Atlantic Attitude Awards, sponsored by Jaguar. Did, did you get a free car, um, and a free trip to New York out of that? <laughs> Do you know what? I should, uh, I, get, I should get someone to look into that. Yeah, and uh, BBC... Music Introducing Artist of the Year? Yeah, that was a big one. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't believe that one. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot. The stars are, are crazy. I, I, it's sort of wonderful and a curse. I don't think I can ever make any more music now. I need to retire. <laughs> so, well, don't do that, but prioritise pleasure. So, prioritising pleasure over pain, over, over duties you have to perform, over work, over what? For me, it's about putting myself first, going home from the pub when I want to, when your mate's like, no, stay. And I'm like, no, do you know what? I want to be alone and watch the telly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, also just, uh, yeah, not, uh, as a woman, I sort of shape-shifted and people pleased chronically and uh, the penny dropped recently. And yes. I thought, what about if I don't do that? I'm like, yes. got a lot better. So <laughs> please yourself. And yeah. yeah. So were these songs written in lockdown and self-reflective moods? Or no, the, not really. No. I, I'd written most of it before the pandemic. I'd written all of it before the pandemic pandemic and I demoed it and um, then I sat in that first wave with all the demos knowing exactly how I wanted to produce it but not having the ability to which was very frustrating but in a way sort of enforced patience on me who is an artist who's quite um, I can be quite um, <laughs> rushed and trigger happy yeah. in my decision making. Um, well one of your tracks is called Moody. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does that reflect you in any way or is it about well, other yeah. people? Yeah. Sometimes I'm in a mood and that's always been used against me but being human is yeah. very difficult. So of course sometimes it's that idea that we're meant to be like fine all the time is, yeah. is my point with that song really. Also okay. it's really funny. Alright so you're going to do I do this all the time. Thank you very Thank much you for, so for much, joining Mary. coming it's in. Nice to be back. Look up.
for a couple of weeks and then I start doing them again. This sun is making me feel like I'm missing out on something, but if I went to your barbecue, I'd be uncomfortable and I'd not be sure what to say anyway. If I want to go to your birthday drink to congratulate you being the age I already thought you were, or not, I don't know. It's a miracle I've remembered at all. When I'm buried in the ground, I will be able to make your birthday drinks, but I will still feel guilty. You see, when the air warms up like this, it brings every single memory of you back, and it makes me so sick, I can't breathe. Except I'm still breathing on time. Sometimes I think that's the problem. So look up, out there stop trying to have so many friends don't be intimidated by all the babies they have don't be embarrassed that all you've had is fun prioritize pleasure don't send those long paragraph texts stop it don't getting married isn't the biggest day of your life all the days that you get to have are big be wary of the favors that they do to you in that little dress of yours. If you weren't doing this, you'd be working at McDonald's to try and cheer up. I'm not sure. You're moving around so much. You need to stand still. Be more like Maraid. Shh. Stop showing off. You're a good girl. You're a good tall girl. You're a good sturdy girl. One day, I would love to tell you how the best night of your life was the absolute worst of mine. I'm just sat here feeling stupid for trying. My hunger times my impatience equals the problem. You're beautiful. I want the best for you. But I also hope that you fail without me. It was really rather miserable trying to love you. and you were asleep and I wasn't checking my phone for a moment and I felt... Thank you very much. Self-esteem prioritised pleasure is available now. Self-esteem is touring until the 25th of March next year. You can check her website for dates. You might have to book into the new year because most of this year's dates are sold out already. You can certainly listen to Self-esteem performing Moody on the Loose Ends web page. Now, Carla Valentine is something of a specialist in death. She's a mortician, a fellow of the Association of Anatomical Pathology Technology and an associate member of the Death and Culture Network. She 
She's also technical curator of the Bart's Pathology Museum. In her latest book, Carla investigates the who done what and the how they done it in the novels and stories of Agatha Christie. It's called Murder Isn't Easy, the forensic of Agatha Christie. But uh, it's your interest in pathology and poisons and all that was actually sparked. One of the things that sparked you off was the, was the works of Agatha Christie in the first place. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'm going to caveat this first just by saying that unlike Al, I am not used to a live audience yeah. at all. <laughs> <laughs> all of my audience tends to not talk back to me oh. or laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, so I did, um, I, I did sort of ten, ten years uh, worth of work in mortuaries assisting uh, pathologists doing autopsies. Yeah. And then I've been at Bart's Pathology Museum for another ten years. So very much older pieces of, yeah. of dead people. And all of that that's the whole idea of me working in um, the death industry in forensics came from picking up Agatha Christie's books as a yes. child. I think you mentioned you also had the misfortune to see your grandfather die. You were absolutely there. Uh, this is all at a young age, seven, mm -hmm. eight, when you're reading Agatha Christie and seeing that happen. Definitely. So there's a slightly unusual interest for, for children. Did you not have Barbie dolls and other... Uh, other? I, I did. I, I took their heads off. <laughs> <laughs> from what I remember. No, I mean, it was, it was in my first book, Mortems actually that I talk more about my, my sort of life as, as a mortician and I do yeah. discuss the fact that I saw my, my granddad die and I think it was definitely a pivotal moment but I was already really interested in biology and you know my, my family famously tell me that when I was you know six or seven I said I want a microscope for Christmas you know and I was I was that kid that took it into show and tell right. at school much to the annoyance of every other seven year old that would just thought what on earth is this yeah. so yeah I was already kind of on the path I think. And Agatha Christie you obviously respect for the her technical knowledge which actually gets better as she writes more and more books but she, mm. along the way she's making an effort to make sure she describes the effect of a poison and not just oh it was indetectable or something yeah absolutely i mean she obviously she started by writing what she knew which is what most people do and she was a dispenser during the war so she wrote about poisons and um but what's actually really spectacular about that first book the mysterious affair of styles which was you know published in 1920 1921 um, she talks about Poirot having a crime scene examiner's kit mm. and a crime scene examiner's kit did not exist in real life not until 1924 um, so she'd actually kind of sort of pre preconceived that idea right. she's also the person who coined the phrase the scene of the crime it never been used before 1923 in the murder on the links and now we use it all the time facts and fiction you know I, I did forensics at uni I know what the scene of the crime is I was never told about the Christie connection but uh, do you think she actually invented it and then the, in real life people started using it because they read it as a yeah a, yeah yeah definitely I mean it did happen with with Conan Doyle as well a lot of, of Conan Doyle's um, Sherlock's work they introduced forensics that didn't really exist but um, Conan Doyle kind of based a lot of his work yeah. on a real uh, surgeon called Joseph Bell so it does it does happen you're using the word forensics in the way that's mm. kind of it's sort of migrated doesn't it because forensic forensic just means in court so all mm. evidence everything happens in court is forensic but we now tend to casually use it to mean the scientific bit. Yeah, well, we, we say forensic science specifically to mean um, science pertaining to, you know, some sort of judicial issue. Yeah. But I think the problem is that now it is used in, in a way that we might say, you know, forensic analysis of the football match between Fulham and Liverpool, you know, and yeah. it just means, like, analytical. But when Christie was around, she probably would have said criminalistics. Yeah. She might have said medico-legal. Um, it wasn't really used until sort of, like, the, the middle and later half of, of the 1900s. Are, are you a, 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 an Agatha Christie well, fan? Well, I, I, I certainly did read it, read a sort of ton of them when I was a, when I was a teenager, and I, I haven't read them in a while. But I've just re been reading about her, um, and I, I, I mean, I think because it, it, after all, she's she's not regarded as literature. She it's because it, it, it's yeah. sort of it's sort of English seen as English pulp, isn't it? it rather is a bit, literature. Isn't it? But but she sold what two billion books or something. I mean, the, the scale of her yeah. influence mm. is gigantic, and uh, I mean. Do, you, do they work as mysteries, though, from a, from a, from a sorry, forensic point of view, to use a better word? Well, they, they do. I mean, and that's what's so interesting about the fact that she did... She, she wrote across 50, de uh, 50 decades, or five decades, mm. so you can kind of see the development of the forensics, uh, the nascent science of real forensics through her work. Um, and so she does use the forensics correctly for the most part. She sometimes makes mistakes. She then mentions in later books those mistakes that she's made. She, like, puts them in the words of, you know, a character. But I think the problem with Christie is that there's this idea that she's just not that good of a writer. She's a good mystery plotter and she's not that good of a writer and her characters are a bit two-dimensional. But we are gradually seeing um, a real sort of 
a renaissance in looking at her as a proper writer. Her books coming after the First World War, they it's part of this sort of morbid age idea but between, between the two wars that, that people are very very bleak about human nature because I think mm. the, the mysteries are bleak about human nature. The people kill for sort of very basic reasons, mm. jealousy, money, yeah. um, uh, uh, that's, but, that's, yeah, that's, that's three, and, three, and three and or four motivations. And, yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and, and is, that, is that what her books are, are also doing? Because after the First World War, you do have this massive mor morbidity in, the, in, in culture, don't you? Yeah, of course, and then you have the, you know, the sort of um, the excess women, because lots of the men had died, and you know, those sorts of things are, are mentioned in her books, but I, I think, I mean, th there are troughs, peaks and troughs in it, and in particular, she didn't talk about the Second World War straight after it, yeah. but some of the later books that she then based in that time, you know, they talk about rationing, they talk about the men who'd fought in the wars feeling really kind of like they'd had a sense of purpose, but they just couldn't fit into this sort of new peaceful world so they would end up you know being what what she would call rather a cad you know a <laughs> um, bit of like you know gambling or getting all the women on the go at the same time they just couldn't fit into we're, we're looking world. quite a long way back there because she should remind herself she 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 was still alive she died in 1976 mm. so she's got some plenty of later books as well she mm. kept going can i ask you about your museum a uh, pathology museum in Barts, St Bartholomew's Hospital it's, I think it's the oldest hospital in the in the country it is yeah. and um and uh, I've, I've, the extraordinary thing you mentioned in your book is to do with Dr. Crippen. Um, oh, yeah. So Dr. Crippen is remembered because he was, uh, he was trapped or, or arrested on, a, on a escaping to America, a radio telegraph or something. Oh. But in due course, they found human remains in his house, and that was always assumed to be his wife who had been apparently murdered. But you, what can you tell us about the human remains that you've got? Well, so the, the first thing about Dr. Crippen is that everybody seems to think he's this incredibly evil character, but he was, you know, he was only accused of murdering his wife. That's only one person. It, Plenty, you kill one yeah, person. Yeah, you put one person, <laughs> yeah. and you know you've got a waxwork in Madame Tussauds. Yeah. Um, so they did find human remains in, in the um, cellar of the house that he was living with his mistress, and they were unidentifiable. No head, no genitalia, no, no hands, fingerprints. And Dr. Bernard Spilsbury, a very eminent pathologist who used to teach, actually, at Bart's Pathology uh, Museum when it was morbid anatomy, school he identified the remains as Cora Crippen by a scar that appeared to be on some abdominal tissue yeah. now we have got Bernard Spilsbury's original slides they're not in my museum they're in our sister museum at Whitechapel right. and in 2008 they were um, DNA tested by a team of scientists in America and what they discovered once they would found all of these relatives of Cora Crippen and compared all the DNA they found out that the remains not only are they not Cora Crippen what? they are not even female <laughs> <laughs> so the mystery continues a hundred years later. Anyway, uh, murder isn't easy, which is a title you've nicked from Agatha Christie it herself. It is indeed, yeah. Um, yes, uh, the yeah. forensics of Ag Agatha Christie is available now. Carla Valentine, thank you very much for coming on, thank telling us all about you. it. OK, it's so now time to throw over to Emma Freud in L.A. to interview Daniel Mays, who's sitting opposite me. So you might not remember the name Daniel Mays, but I absolutely guarantee that you know both his face and his brilliance. In the 20 years of his professional career, he's acted in 33 films and around about 200 TV programmes. His performances are always unexpected and gripping in everything from Good Omens to Fisherman's Friends, from Made in Dagenham to Dez. And he'll forever be remembered for his blazing BAFTA-nominated performance in The Line of Duty. Next week, he kicks off season two of Sky TV's Temple, playing a doomsday-obsessed underground expert alongside the mighty Mark Strong. Um, Daniel, it's a weird show, it's an amazing show, but it's a very complicated one and your character is a doomsday prep hope. Did you research that a lot? Uh, I had to do a hell of a lot of research. It was a world that I knew nothing about and I uh, just threw myself into it. It's quite a nihilistic view of the world, isn't it? If the world was going to end, how would you cope with that? And my character, Lee, um, is in his element, you know, in this show and he he just elevates the show. He's a great component and partner in crime to Mark Strong's character. Um, but yeah, prepping was a, was a world that I knew nothing about. 
I think the brilliance of Temple is that it's got that dark humour, but it's also a bit cop drama. It's also a bit medical drama. I mean, it's very, yeah. it's, it's it's a new genre, isn't it? It's it's. It it's pretty much impossible to kind of pigeonhole this show. There's so much going on. Like you said, there's police in it, but it's not a procedural drama. There's medical operations, but it's not that. And at the heart of it is this kind of amazing story of this uh, high-flying surgeon played by Mark Strong, Daniel Milton, who has kept his wife. She, his wife has contracted this fictitious disease, Lancaster's, and he's basically kept her alive in this underground operating theatre clinic underneath Temple Tube Station. And uh, so his character, along with mine, Lee, form this kind of very shady, illicit relationships, a relationship that, uh, you know, basically gives operations to criminals and people off the grid. Uh, in order to keep his wife alive down there. And there was a humongous cliffhanger at the end of the first season with a big shootout. And literally the last frame of the series, it was Beth, Mark's uh, wife in it, her eyes open, and that was the whole climax. So in season two, we get to see all of that kind of play out. I was trying to see if I could find a common theme between the, the, the work that you've done, the parts that you've played. And the one thing I could find is that you like complicated characters. And I think if you can't find a complicated character, you make the character more complicated. Um, I guess that's just how it's panned out. You have to always... I mean, I did a lot of early work I did with Mike Lee. I know I did two films with Mike, and that was an amazing education because you have to... He demands you to play the character in the round. You know, um, all of his characters are always kind of really truthful and as three-dimensional as they get. And I think that was such a huge learning curve for me. And I think I've always tried to apply what Mike taught me into all the subsequent roles that I've taken on. And you're right, you know, you have to play, you know, no one's just bad. You have to find the different colours in it and, and delve into their background and ask the questions why that character behaves in that certain way. Um, and Lee's a great example of that. There's a lot going on with him. You know, he's a very insecure, insular character. And yet the relationship that he has with Mark and this journey that they go on allows him to sort of break free of those constraints. So um, he's a conflicted character. All, all the best characters are, are contradictions, aren't they? Yeah, and I would also suggest that your face is a contradiction. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> are you, that's a lovely compliment. <laughs> how, how would you describe it? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly described as um, baby face. I once, I once got a review. It's funny how you remember the, the bad ones, isn't it? But I once read a review that I look like a thwarted man cub on the edge of a tantrum at any given moment. <laughs> it's funny what you remember, Clive, yes. isn't it? Well, you've got, a, you've got a beard today, so is that a way of uh, investing a different character to your face? It's not so baby face today. Oh, I'm just trying to hide my baby face. Yeah. That's all it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's also the kind of perfect face to be to be the lovable rogue or the unlovable rogue or the naughty best friend or the kind best friend. And, and those, to some extent, are the roles that you've had so far. Have you got frustrated with relentlessly not being cast? as the leads. I know you are now getting the leads, but that's been a long career playing the number two character. Um, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, there's always frustration, isn't there, in an actor's career. It's all relative, isn't it? You're always, or I'm certainly looking at the guys above you on that ladder going, why am I not playing that role? Um, but I can't complain. I've had a very, you know, a varied and very eclectic and interesting career in the 20 years I've been working, you know. Um, it's the age-old question, isn't it? Am I a character actor or am I a leading man? It's sort of the actors that I always really aspire to, the people like the Gary Oldmans and the, the Daniel Day-Lewis and, 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 you know, someone like Mark Strong, is that they, they're such brilliant actors. They have the capabilities of being phenomenal character actors and yet they've been able to sort of branch out into leading man roles. I think that's probably... That's where I need to be heading. I've got a last question, which is that when you first left RADA, yeah. you couldn't get a job for six months, so you took a role as a camera assistant at a casting agent. And you must have spent... I know what happens with camera assistants and casting agents. You spend six months 
filming other actors having auditions. It was more it was more like an extras uh, casting agency. Oh, it was Jane shit. Collins casting in uh, King's Cross and then yeah, so I would, would see streams and streams of people coming in. Um, yeah, I mean I, I I I couldn't get arrested in the first six months of uh, leaving drama school. It's been a long, gradual, really enjoyable, slow burn for me. And hopefully, yeah, long may continue. Danny, thank you. Temple Series 2 is available on Sky Max and Now TV from the 28th of October. When is that? End of next week. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you, Emma Freud. Good to see you down the line, enjoying yourself in the sun or whatever it is doing in, in L.A. Yeah, I'll be going back to my books now. <laughs> More music now from the singer-songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, producer, filmmaker and author Griff Rees. Griff is one of an array of Welsh and international stars lined up to form in the Festival of Voice International Arts Festival taking place in the Millennium Centre in Cardiff from the 4th to the 7th of November. In addition to Griff, contributors include Max Richter, Brian Eno, Charlotte Church's Late Night Dungeon and Hot Chip. While Griff prepares for that, he's found time to make a special Loose Ends recording of a song, Can't Carry On. Well, here he is.
Uh, thank you. That was Griff Reese and Can't Carry On, taken from the album Seeking New Gods, which is available now. Griff's performing at Festival of Voice on Saturday the 6th of November. The festival itself runs from the 4th to the 7th at Wales Millennium Centre, Cardiff Bay. Griff's also playing Electric Ballroom London on the 27th of October, supported by Bill Ryder-Jones. You can check his website for all other dates. So let's come to Pearl Mackey, whose stage, film and TV career includes playing the groundbreaking role of Bill Potts in the Peter Capaldi version of Doctor Who. She's just about to appear alongside Ben Aldridge in ITV's new crime series, The Long Call. You're a police officer in this. I am a police officer, yes. I'm a detective sergeant, Jen Rafferty. Um... Yeah, but the, the Long Call essentially uh, is based on a book by Anne Cleves, who uh, most notably has written the very successful TV series, Vera. And it focuses on D.I. Matthew Venn, played by the lovely Ben Aldridge, mm -hmm. you mentioned, who essentially is investigating this murder, this sort of very com complicated kind of intricate murder. But through that, he kind of has to revisit his community, the Bar and Brethren, which are a fictional community, that essentially ostracised him as a young man for his sexuality turfed him out for being gay essentially so he's kind of through investigating this murder he kind of has to sort of confront his family particularly sort of dealing with his mother and um yeah just sort of a lot of issues that he's kind of kept buried for quite a long yeah. time and sort of has forces him to kind of readdress those so he's happily married to his male uh, he to, is to his happily, husband yes very uh, happily married, but, yeah. but as you say that that of course grief and and threw him out of that all-embracing community, the, the the brethren. Yeah, indeed. In the West of, Country, this is set in. It is. It's set in Devon, yeah. And it kind of, yeah, it just sort of, well, forced him to kind of recognise the flaws within his community because obviously they're not completely not accepting of him for who he is. It's just a really interesting exploration of sexuality as well. And, I mean, great for ITV to have, a, you know, a queer lead in, you know, primetime drama. It's, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's fantastic. It's quite brown, groundbreaking as well. Which is and you're a, a fellow officer. Uh, I am. Uh, but we see something of your home life as well. And we do, uh, I've yeah. only seen the first episode, but I think there may be more to come about your background. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you're, you've got a bit of a messy home life, which is yeah, sometimes is the case with fictional uh, police officers. Yes, I mean, I think so. I think it's important to show the humanity of police officers within dramas. I think that's one of the interesting things about The Long Call, you know, it sort of explores mm -hmm. backstory. And for Jen particularly, when we meet her, she's just recently escaped um, quite an abusive marriage with the father of her children and has lived in urban London with, with, with the husband and recently relocated to Devon. But yeah, we sort of meet her as she's kind of struggling with dealing with two teenage kids as mm. a single mother, newly and sort of balancing her work life and her home life. And this is the West Country, I think you, you studied in, in Bristol. I did, So yes. it's your, your part of the world to that extent. Yeah, kind of. I guess I lived in Bristol for about five years in total. Yeah. I was at uni and then drama school there. Yeah. So it was quite surreal being back there, actually. Yeah. I was staying like down the road from where my first halls of residence was like, when I was 18. And it was just really quite bizarre walking around and, you know, it's like one of those, like, if walls could talk kind of things. You're sort of walking down the street and, like, a million memories jump out at you. You're like, oh, yeah, that's where so-and-so threw up. And, oh, <laughs> I had my birthday in there. And, oh, that's when I had a fight with my mate. And, yes. you know, like, loads of just sort You've of... You've got a lot of studying cities. done as well in between oh, these know, incidents, obviously. Very studious. Yeah. <laughs> entire, yeah, yeah, very dedicated to my studies. Well, I mean, I studied drama in both places. Yeah. And but walking on will write. Walking around like. the sorry, walking around <laughs> the streets now. Are you always being interrupted by Doctor Who fans saying, "Oh, um, you know"? I mean, when the show was on, definitely that was a feature of of day to day life. I mean, it doesn't happen all the time anymore. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe um, this new hairstyle is a disguise. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, Doctor, you do find Doctor Who fans everywhere. You know, I met some fans yesterday. I was at an, uh, an art show, and. Um, Met some fans there, which was nice, but, you know, it's always a bit of a surprise. I'm always <laughs> like, oh, what? Oh, yeah, no, that is me. Oh, hi. Yeah. You, you were teasing somebody the other day in an interview, saying, oh, maybe maybe your character could come back, uh, you know, with a change of, uh, a change of the Doctor. Uh, is, I mean, that... you know, anything's possible, yeah. isn't it? Or... <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're leaving it. Would you, would you welcome, you know, returning to, to Doctor Who, or was that...? I mean, you know, for, for me... As an actor, I think it's it's really nice to explore new things and it's nice to explore new characters. Yeah. But that 
you know, that doesn't mean to say I didn't. I had an amazing time playing Bill. If the story was right, then I wouldn't rule it out. But right. so, you okay. know, that's um. There's going to be a Twitter uh, campaign. Oh uh, gosh, I know. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. As soon as you say anything about it, everyone's like, yeah. Oh my God, she yeah. said this. And it's like I mean, you know, I just would. I don't. I wouldn't want to rule it out, but also I wouldn't want to get anyone's hopes up falsely. <laughs> <laughs> how do you um? How do you compare, you know, acting in a um, TV series like that with or your stage work? I saw you in The Birthday Party oh, did years you? ago. Oh, marvellous. Thank which you. Which is Thanks Harold, for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Harold Pinter, um, which is a very particular form of, of, of right. acting and, and, and performance. Uh, is that the sort of thing you really enjoy doing, or is that just, I mean... I enjoy all of it, to be honest. Yeah. It's just nice to be working, isn't it? <laughs> Especially after a pandemic. I mean, um, yeah, I'd love to do more stage work. I mean, it presents a really different challenge in the way that it's keeping it fresh and new every night for, you know, every every audience that it's the first time they've experienced mm. it. Or even, even if it's the fourth or fifth time they've experienced yes. it, you know, that it still needs to be as vibrant and as truthful as it was, you know, on the opening night. Mm. But then I think, you know, with TV, it, it, that presents a different challenge as well in terms of, you know, you've got to keep it fresh for 45 takes. But yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, I would love to continue doing both. Okay, so for the moment, uh, Pearl Mackey, uh, we could see you in the long call, yes. and, and that's on ITV. It is, ITV, Monday the 25th um, at 9pm, and then every, every night subsequently until its finale on Thursday the 28th. And if you'd like to hear Pearl starring in a Radio 4 drama, you can download all the episodes of the acclaimed eco-thriller Forest 404 on BBC Sounds. And it comes from the accompanying talks and soundscapes, lots to listen to there. But that's the Loose Ends tied up for another week. Thank you for listening. If you just missed this programme, you can find it on BBC Sounds along with previous editions of Loose Ends, including last week's Out of This World interview with the Canadian astronaut and now novelist Chris Hadfield. Uh, thank you to this week's guests, Cara Valentine, Pearl Mackey and Al Murray, Self Esteem and Griff Rees, Emma Freud and Daniel Mays. Today's producer is Suki Firth, studio manager Gail Gordon. Next week, my guests will include Manfred Mann's Mike Darbo. But from me for now, goodbye. And Loose Ends was presented by Clive Anderson. The producer was Suki Firth. And if you'd like to listen again to any of the recent music performances on the show, just head to the Loose Ends page of the Radio 4 website. My ears are never closed to new sounds. Music's the soundtrack to my life. Now on BBC Sounds. Double grr. You can get even more Cray Charles. We're constantly caring about your musical education, new approaches, new genres. With music to get you moving. Put a wiggle in your walk and a pep in your step. Everyone is invited. And a brand new show from Six Music. Expect punk, funk, blues, soul, hip-hop, rock and roll, techno, go-go, indie guitar, reggae, ska, and conversations with the stars. Just search for Craig Charles on the BBC Sounds app. Groovy. Well, she's been called the UK's strictest head teacher, and Catherine Burble Singh has landed a new job as the government's social mobility commissioner, a role designed to level up disadvantaged communities. She's the subject of profile here on Radio 4 in a couple of minutes just after the news. And then Sir Paul McCartney will be revealing the key moments and events that shaped his life as a songwriter. That's when he meets John Wilson in This Cultural Life at 7.15. BBC News at 7 o'clock. Campaigners and political leaders in England's city regions have cautiously welcomed the Chancellor's pledge to spend nearly £7 billion on improving public transport links outside London. Greater Manchester will receive the largest amount of money. Its Labour regional mayor Andy Burnham has told the BBC that the news felt like a breakthrough. A further £1.2 billion of funding will help to make bus services cheaper and more frequent. And as part of a £3 billion package announced by Boris Johnson in March, our business correspondent Katie Austin has more. Both of these initiatives are really aimed at trying to help bridge the gap between transport provision in the capital and other places. And in so doing, make it easier for people to get from where they live to their places of work or travel for leisure and generally boost the economies by doing that. There's quite a range of projects that might come about as a result, including what are described as cutting-edge carriages for Greater Manchester's Metrolink, for example, other expansions of tram networks and even battery packs for Merseyrail trains.
Teaching unions have called for tougher COVID measures in schools in England to combat a rise in infections. The Association of School and College Leaders says some of its members are on their knees as they try to cope. Downing Street has said the situation across the board is constantly under review and the current focus is on getting more people vaccinated. The film director, who was hurt in a shooting accident involving the actor Alec Baldwin, has issued a statement after being released from hospital. Joel Souza said he was gutted by the death of the cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Court documents suggest that Alec Baldwin was told that a prop gun was safe moments before firing it on the set of his new film Rust in New Mexico. The environmental campaigner Greta Thunberg has urged world leaders to be honest at the upcoming COP26 summit on climate change in Glasgow. She said that too often politicians weren't being straight with the public and were looking for excuses to avoid significant action. BBC News. This is BBC Radio 4, where now it's time for Profile. Hello, is this Buckingham Palace? Yes, this is Miss Mirabel Singh.